Hello everybody, this is Dan Trotter, Pretty Good Bible Studies. The video you are about to see is the fourth one in a series of videos that deal with miscellaneous topics in uh, preterism. I call it Preterist Potpourri. If you would like to study Orthodox Preterism in a more systematic fashion, uh, might I suggest to you that you look for this thumbnail, Orthodox Preterist Playlist, on YouTube and you can see a series of videos on my uh, channel in this playlist that deal with Olivet Discourse, Daniel, and the Book of Revelation. I hope you enjoy this video. All right, let's uh, look at this last section of my PowerPoints here, which I call Miscellaneous Preterist Passages. Last video, I talked about the use of the term coming and last days in Scripture, and I showed beyond a shadow of a doubt that the word coming and the word last days does not necessarily have to refer to the second advent, Jesus coming at the end of the world. It can, but it doesn't have to necessarily. And in this video, I'm going to take up two topics. First, I'm going to look at the passage in 2 Peter 3, verses 11 through 13, where Peter says the elements will melt in heat, in which futurists, and, and in fact a lot of preterists also, take that as referring to the end of the world. And then I'm going to very briefly look at the phrase, day of the Lord, which I will show does not necessarily have to mean the second coming of Christ. All right, well, let's look at 2 Peter 3, 10 through 13. Elements melting in the heat. I'm going to read the passage to you, and I'm going to use the English Standard Version, and I'm going to point out to you how this so much sounds like the end of the world. It is so ingrained in the Christian mindset that the world is going to burn up with fire at the end of the world. And it's translations like this that give that impression. I'm going to go through this passage later and show you that Actually, the arguments that Peter here is not referring to the end of the world, but to the end of the Jewish order, the arguments are very strong. I've got six arguments. I'm going to go through them one by one. And, to, and if you think this is an offbeat, fringe interpretation, let me point out to you that one of the most brilliant Puritan theologians that existed, John Owen of Oxford University in the 17th century, he held exactly the same opinion I do, and he was not nuts. So uh, with that preface, let's read 2 Peter 3.10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved. Notice that, it, that phrase, heavenly bodies, that's a key phrase there. I'm going to show you later that it, uh, that it does not have to be translated heavenly bodies. These heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, since all these things are thus to be dissolved what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of god there's the judgment day day of the lord day of god because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved and the heavenly bodies will melt as they as they burned we are waiting for a new heavens and a new earth. Well, there's the new heavens and the new earth. And, of course, I've already uh, examined that before. But uh, people say that refers to the final state of the millennium. Something at the end. We've got heavenly bodies burning up. The day of God. Oh, this is a futurist favorite verse. Well, let's look at six arguments that, that uh, say that Peter was referring this to 87. He's realizing that my standard of proof is high because uh, the... The appearances make it appear that we're, t that we're looking at a futurist verse. All right, the first argument is this. Are only pagans to be burnt up but not Christians? I mean, after all, this is the end of the world, and if the earth world's going to be burnt up, what's going to happen to the Christians? Are we going to fry too? Well, that doesn't really fit in with most futurist schemes because most futurist schemes have us being raised get our judgments before the millennium, and then uh, we're going to then walk into the millennium, which is on earth, which I don't, well, I guess uh, maybe most future schemes actually have the earth burning up at the end of the millennium, I guess, uh, in which case uh, um, we're getting ready to enter into the final state, 
But how are we going to enter into the, into the final state if we're on the earth that's getting burnt up? Seems like we'd be fried. Well, I'm not the only one that has thought of this. Um, I'm going to show you a quote from a second, a, th a third century um, skeptic named Celsus, a very famous guy uh, in church history. Uh, let me read this quote to you and see if you can answer him. Now, I hate to quote scoffers and skeptics, but uh, I also hate to have Christianity exposed to attacks of scoffers and skeptics that are hard to answer. This is what he said. He said, it is silly to suppose that when God, like a cook, brings the fire, the rest of mankind will be roasted and only the Christians will remain. Really, it is the hope of worms. It is only the simpletons, the ignoble, the senseless, the most uneducated and common men, whoever is a sinner or a godforsaken fool. Well, now that's a, that's a pretty damning quote. And I would never say that a futurist was a simpleton or a godforsaken fool, but I, I would ask him, how do you answer Celsus? That's a very, very good question. I mean, where are the Christians? Where are they when the earth is being built, burnt up? Well, I'll leave that one for your... Um, thought and discussion later on. Let's go to argument number two. Uh, before we get there, let's read 2 Peter 3.12 or reread it. In the ESV, Peter says this, the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But now notice that the NIV takes the same verse and says the elements will melt in the heat. That word is elements. Now, Let's look at argument number two. The Greek word for elements, stoicheion, does not mean heavenly bodies. And that's actually an overstatement. It can mean heavenly bodies. If you look up Thayer's lexicon, it's buried down there in a list of uh, definitions that, have, that say things like the fundamental things, the, the basic things. Uh, and where the idea of heavenly bodies came from comes from, uh, apparently, according to Thayer, is that in ancient times, people thought that the fundamental parts of humanity, their bodies, their brains, their souls, whatever, came from the, from the planets or from the stars, from the heavenly bodies. And so when you're talking about elemental things, the elemental things of human beings would be heavenly bodies. So the ESV translates it that way. But most of the definitions have nothing to do with that. But that doesn't prove anything one way or the other, really. But this is what it's telling here. If you look at the six other places in the New Testament Scripture where a stoicheion is used, that Greek word for elements never, ever refers to heavenly bodies. It always refers to, six times, it always refers to either law or principle. Now, these I'm going to give you the six exclusive times in the New Testament where the word is used outside of our uh, disputed passage here. And you will see as we go through here that the word does not mean heavenly bodies and in fact means either law or principle. And, and, and where we're going with this is Peter is talking about the end of the legal principles of the Old Testament order. That's what he's talking about. The end of the law or the end of the um, not necessarily the Old Testament, the good law, the God's law, but the, uh, the Pharisaical law, the end of that legalistic system. That's what he's talking about. All right, let's, uh, as I've, I've said here, all other places in the New Testament, it is never, uh, it, the word stoicon never means heavenly bodies. Rather, it means law or principles, I just said. Now, here are the six examples, and as I said, they're exhaustive. Here's the first one in Galatians 4. Three, uh, in the same way we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. There's the word stoicon right there, elementary principles. Well, Paul is writing to the Galatians here, and you, and you know the, the background of Galatians. He is attacking the legalists in, in, in the Galatian churches. And he says we were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. What he means was we were enslaved to the legalistic principles of of the world that you Galatians have, are now going back into. And when he was talking about children, he was ta talking about the law is, a, is a, 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 a tutor that leads us to Christ. He was talking about we were children under the Old Testament. 
we were under the Old Testament elementary principles of the world. He was not talking about heavenly bodies. He was talking about the law. So there's example number one. Example number two, Galatians 4, 9. How can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more? In other words, don't go back to the law. You're going to be slaves. I'm not sure whether Paul's talking about the Old Testament law or the rabbinic uh, pharisaical laws that were uh, perversions of the law. But either way, you're not supposed to go back under the law. And, and it definitely does not mean don't go back and become enslaved to the heavenly bodies. It doesn't mean that. Third example of Stoyakon. Colossians 2.8. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world. Again, Paul is writing the book of Colossians. What's he fighting? He's fighting legalism. That's his common knowledge. And he says, don't be captive to that. Don't be captive to philosophy. Don't be captive to human tradition according to the elemental spirits of the world. In other words, according to the legalistic principles of the world. He's not really talking about the Old Testament law, so to speak, but he's talking about uh, uh, principles of the world that lead to bondage. He's not talking about heavenly bodies. The Colossians were no, in no danger of becoming slaves to Saturn or slave to Mars or Alpha Centauri. Fourth example, Colossians 2.20, if with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, if with Christ you died to the law, to put it more... Uh, traditional parlance, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Notice the word regulations. That's the legalistic things that the Colossians were coming up with to enslave themselves to. And Paul calls these regulations elemental spirits. The Colossians were not being enslaved to Pluto or Uranus or Mercury. They were being enslaved to legalistic regulations right there in the verse. Obviously, the context is very clear. Now let's go to the fifth example of Stoichion elements. Hebrews 5.12. You need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. The oracles of God. Now let me read you a quote from David Chilton who is a uh, prominent preterist theologian. He says this, in context, the writer is clearly speaking of Old Covenant truths, especially since he connects it with the term oracles of God, an expression generally used for the provisional Old Covenant revelation. So Paul here, and he, it's not Paul, excuse me, the author of Hebrews says, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God, the basic laws of God. He's talking about laws or he's talking about principles. He is not talking about stars or planets. All right, one more example. This is Hebrews 6, 1. The author says, Therefore let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, the elementary principles of Christ, and go on to maturity. So you see, beyond a shadow of a doubt, the word used in the New Testament does not refer to heavenly bodies. All right, let's move now to the third argument, why 2 Peter 3 is not referring to the burning up of the planets at the end of the world or the burning up of the earth, but is rather referring to AD 70. Let me read to you the relevant por portion of the passage. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, the elements, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? All right, here's argument number three. How are Peter's readers exhorted by an end of the world fire. You need to be holy because 2,000 plus years from now when the world ends, it's going to burn up and you don't want to be caught in that. You want to be living godly when you get burned up. I, I don't even know, uh, not only the time frame is weird, 2,000 plus years, how is that going to exhort Peter's believers then as he was writing to them? How is that going to help them any? But also, how is the fact of getting burnt up in a fire, how is that going to make you live godly? What's the reward for living godly? Oh, I'm holy, I'm holy, I'm praying every day, I'm reading my Bible, and I get burnt up in a fire. Some reward. So that's argument number three. Peter expected something near that his readers would have to deal with. That's argument number three.
Let's look at argu argument number four. This is based upon another portion of the passage, which I'll read here. Uh, 2 Peter 3.10 The heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies or the elements will be burned up and dissolved. Well, this is decreation rhetoric, cosmological catastrophe rhetoric, which we've seen in the Olivet Discourse and it's all through the Old Testament prophets over and over and over and over again. Isaiah, all of them, or most of them. They've got the sun turning dark, the moon turning to blood, the stars falling from the sky like figs from a tree, the, the sky rolling up like a mantle, the mountains being split. This is typical uh, prophetic rhetoric. It does not, it cannot be taken literally. So it could be very well here that Peter is referring to, uh, is using decreation rhetoric, and he's not, doesn't mean for it to be taken literally. And I give you an example of this. There's many examples, but my favorite one is Isaiah 13.10, which clearly refers to Babylon, because right in verse 1, Isaiah says this is concerning Babylon. And we know that Babylon went down in 586 B.C. And, and this is what Isaiah said. He said, Indeed, the stars of the sky and its constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark when it rises, which, of course, is impossible. And the moon will not shine. Well, all that means is Babylon's going down. This is the rhetoric that prophets used when they were trying to show regime change or the end of one empire or one kingdom and the rise of another. Big, big, big events in history were symbolized by big, big, big events in cosmology. So it could be very well that Peter is just saying, hey, boy, there's going to be a big change when the Jews go down the people who are persecuting us, who kill the Messiah and who kill the prophets from Abel to Zechariah. They're going down. It's time to use some decoration rhetoric like all the other prophets do. And when I say et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that means there's tons of examples of this. No futurists will ever point them out to you, by the way. I never had, in all the decades of, of years that I lived under futurism, I never had one time had a futurist point out to me these verses. I wonder why. All right, here's argument number five, why Peter was referring to AD 70. Let me read the verse, the relevant verse. 2 Peter 3.10 says this, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. Well, day of the Lord, this is, this is more of a defensive argument rather than an offensive one, but uh, the day of the Lord does not necessarily mean the end of the world. I've actually pointed that out in a previous video, and I'm going to point it out at the end of this video again. We'll look at that again very briefly. But day of the Lord just does not, you cannot say it means the end of the world. Now here's one example, Isaiah 13, 9. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with wrath and fierce anger, to make the land a desolation and to destroy its sinners from it. Well, Isaiah, as I said earlier, is referring to Babylon, as he says in verse 1. Well, Babylon went down in 586, not the end of the world. And, as, and there's many, many more of the Day of the Lord verses which show the same thing. In fact, I'm going to show you some at the end of this video. Now, let's look at argument number six for the proposition that Peter was referring to 8070 when he said the elements would be burned up. 2 Peter 3.13 says this, We are waiting for new heavens and a new earth. Now, this phrase comes from Isaiah 66, and it's also repeated in Revelation. And it is... I mean, I would say almost everybody says, oh, that's the end of the world. Oh, that's the final state. Some people say it's the millennium. People aren't really sure. But I love to point this out and go back to Isaiah 66 and say, well, now, if it's the millennium or if it's the final state, especially the final state, how do you explain certain things? For example, I think I said Isaiah 66. I meant to say Isaiah 65. In Isaiah 65, 20, we see this. In the new heavens and the new earth, the youth will die at the age of 100. You're going to have death in the new heavens and the new earth? And in verse 20 in Isaiah 65, one who does not reach the age of 100 will be thought accursed. People are going to be having sorrowful thoughts, thinking that people are accursed in the final state. I always thought heaven was going to be perfection and there was not going to be any sadness or crying or tears or sad thoughts. How about Isaiah 65, 22? My chosen ones will wear out the work of their hands. That means that their products of their labor um, are going to physically deteriorate. 
we want to have physical deterioration in the new heavens and the new earth. How about Isaiah 65, 23? They will not bear children for calamity, for they are the offspring of those blessed by the Lord and their descendants with them. They're going to have descendants in heaven. I thought Jesus said there wasn't going to be sex in heaven. Does this mean we're going to have asexual reproduction in the new heavens and the new earth? I don't think that that phrase of Isaiah was really meant to point to the final state because of these objections. And so therefore, when Peter is talking about we're waiting for new heavens and a new earth, I think what he's talking about is we're waiting for the new covenant. I take that same view in Revelation that it's referring to the new covenant. It's not talking about the final state or the millennium. All right, so there are six I think pretty strong arguments to show that Peter was talking about 8070, but now, just to be fair, I'm going to say that there are three arguments that's, that argue for the proposition that Peter was referring to the end of the world. Now here's argument number one, based upon this phrase in 2 Peter 3, verse 3, scoffers will come in the last days. Oh, last days, end of the world. Well, as I've already showed you in a previous video, Last days does not necessarily mean the end of the world. Here's the rejoinder. Not necessarily does it mean the end of the world. And here's the, the, the verse I always go to first. Hebrews 1, 2. Second verse in Hebrews. The author says this. In these last days he has spoken to us by his son. To us meaning us Christians. And he has. That means it's ha already happened in the past. It's a perfect tense which means it's stopped. It's happened. He spoke when Jesus came, died, and resurrected. Crucified, died, resurrected. Last days. It's the last days of the Jewish order. Which Hebrews was written right before AD 70. And so it's the, last, get, the Jewish order is getting ready to vomonos, to go away. 1 Peter 1.20 says this. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you. Jesus was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but he was made manifest in the last times. When was Jesus made manifest? For the sake of you, you guys that I'm writing to in the first century. That was Jesus Christ in the last time. So the last age, and Richard Pratt of RTS Seminary, whose tapes I've been listening to just recently, um, just stated baldly, he said, last times can refer to the times of restoration after the Babylonian exile, 586. It can refer to the, the way he put it was the inauguration, the continuation, or the consummation of the new covenant kingdom, the church. So in other words, it doesn't really tie anything down unless you look at the context. So last days is not going to swing the deal, going to close the deal for futurist, a futurist interpretation of that passage. Now here's uh, another argument, argument number two uh, for the proposition that Peter is talking about the end of the world. The heavens and earth in verses 5 and 6 are physical and therefore the elements that are burned up by context and by parallel construction, they would be physical too. Now this is a fairly strong argument, I think. Uh, the heavens existed long ago. This is in 2 Peter 3, uh, uh, 2 Peter 3, 5 and 6. The heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water. Now, these heavens and earth and water that Peter refers to, that's obviously the physical heavens, the physical earth, and the physical water. In verse 6, he says, The world that then existed was deluged with water. So the world there and water there are referring to physical elements. I've got all of those physical things in red. Then we go down to verse 7, the heavens and earth that now exist, and this is our key phrase, that's what's going to get burnt up. The heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. So there it looks like heavens and earth are stored up for fire. If all these other things are physical, why would not heaven and earth also be physical? And I say that's a fairly strong argument from context. Well, let's see how we might respond to that, how a preterist might respond to that, or how someone who takes a preterist interpretation would respond to that. He would say this, look, the physical is a symbol of the spiritual. So those physical elements that were mentioned, heavens, earth, water, and world, and, and water, those uh, physical elements were a symbol of 
the spiritual, just as the physical universe was unshakable and was nevertheless destroyed, likewise the unshakable Jewish order will be destroyed. So under this interpretation, the heavens and the earth that now exist is apostate Israel and it's stored up for fire, the fire of Jerusalem in AD 70, getting ready to get destroyed. The new heavens and earth, which are mentioned in the previous slide, those would be the new covenant. So in other words, it can be, there's a contrast now between the heavens and earth that now exist and the new covenant which comes after the heavens and earth that now exist. I think that's a pretty good answer. It could go either way, depending on how what your biases are, I suppose. Now let's consider the last of the three arguments for futurists or for those who would like to take a futurist interpretation of 2 Peter 3, 10 through 13. 2 Peter 3, 8 says this, With the Lord one day is as a thousand years. Now I've emphasized the with the Lord there because um, we, we need to realize that uh, there's two different time frames involved with the Lord and with us. Now why did Peter say this? Well, in verse uh, three, Second Peter three nine, he says, "The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise." Why? Because he says, "In the last days, mockers will come with their mock, mocking, and they are mocking Christians because Jesus had not come back like He had promised in the Olivet Discourse. He had taken Peter wrote that what in the mid to late '60s, so it had been thirty plus years and he hadn't come back yet." Well, futurists use this to explain the 2,000 plus years delay. I'm going to argue that what Peter was trying to explain about the, to the scoffers was a 30 plus year delay, not 2,000 plus years. Well, first of all, let's assume that the futurists are right just for the sake of argument and say that Peter is talking about a uh, 2,000 plus year delay that can be explained by the fact that in God's mind, it's just a couple of days. It's a couple of, uh, you know, just not very long. A couple of days, 2,000 plus years, a couple of days. The problem with that argument is, is that uh, it might not be slow to God, but it is slow to the mockers. And if you're going to try to tell scoffers that God is not being slow, I don't know if that's the way to do it. You can say, uh, well, yeah, well, to, with God, you know, God, God's on a different timetable, and he's taking forever and ever and ever. Well, I don't know God ever treats people that way. I mean, when he did the 70 weeks and the... 490 years and Daniel and so forth. You know, I just don't see him, people just uh, punning on uh, time frames and saying, well, it doesn't matter what we think as human beings because God's timetable is different than ours. God is speaking to human beings and he needs to communicate with human beings. I think he's going to use a human time frame. So I don't think that's what Peter meant here. And so, um, but now let me make another rejoinder. Peter told his listeners that Jesus' is coming is now much slower than they expected. There, it's already been slow because they've been mocking. And now he says, don't worry. A day is with the Lord as a thousand years. So that means his coming is going to even be slower than you thought. For example, if I told you, let's say, well, let's say the scoffers thought that it was going to be 10 years before Jesus came back. And... Uh, well, the scoffers wouldn't think that, but let's say a Christian told a scoffer, hey, it's going to be 10 years. You say he's not coming back. He's slow. I think he's coming back in 10 years. I've been reading all the Middle East news reports, all the ge geopolitical shifts, and I've been uh, reading Tim LaHaye and Harold Lindsay, and he's coming back within 10 years. And so then all of a sudden somebody comes to me and says, but wait a minute now, with the Lord, one day is a 1,000 years. So 10 years is 300 and." 3,650 days, and if we multiply a 1,000 years times those days, we end up with 3,650,000 years. So you expect him to come back in 10 years, but you're thinking on the wrong timetable. If you're thinking God's timetable, it's really going to be 3,650,000 years. Well, you tell me I was nuts to tell you something like that, because we think in human terms. This phrase was never meant to try to confuse people who are reading it and just to punt on uh, time frames. Uh, that, but having said that, there's even another problem with this. How does Peter expanding the, the length of delay by saying that God's time frame is such that the d delay on a human scale is going to be much longer than you markers even thought, 
And, uh, and the Christian readers of Peter even thought it's going to be a long, long, long time. So you just need to cool it, Christians. Don't expect him to come back. And then in three verses later in chapter 3, verse 11, Peter says this, Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, the melting of the, the heavenly bodies and the burning up of the earth, according to the futurist viewpoint, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? How does Peter telling his listeners that God has a lot, 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 lot longer timetable than we human beings and than we Christians, how is that going to exhort them to be in lives of holiness and godliness? If, if he's going to come 3,650,000 years later than I thought he was going to come, that's not going to encourage me to be on my toes spiritually that's not going to encourage me to work on my sanctification if i know that jesus is going to be that long far off so by by peter expanding the delay by this saying by saying that the day of the lord is of a thousand years that's not going to help his argument that people ought to live in godliness so i think that this is a is is a, a clever argument the future futurists use but nobody ever thinks about it that it really doesn't make any sense now let's go to uh still staying with the same phrase one day with the lord is a thousand years um let's look at a parallel futurist argument that is often made they say look if these scoffers were talking about or if peter was talking about Jesus is coming in AD 70, and Peter was writing in the mid 60s, say, so that's what, 35 years or so, 30 plus years since Jesus' promises to come. Why would a scoffer start making fun of that? Because 35 years is not very long. Well, to a futurist, it's not long because he's used to thinking in long time periods, 2,000 years. But if you are a human being, especially a, human, a Christian human being who's being persecuted, very badly by these apostate Jews, you would think 30 plus years is a long time. How would you like it if your girlfriend said, and you asked her to marry you, and she said, um, soon, uh, uh, um, 30 plus years? And I said, well, that's not too long to wait. Yes, it is too long to wait. It's too long to wait when you're waiting for somebody to marry you. It's too long to wait if you're being persecuted, if you're waiting for Jesus to come back and tear down the temple one stone from another, not to mention the fact that he said he was going to do it with one generation, but we'll leave that aside. 30 years is a long time for a human being, and that would make scoffers think that, yes, Jesus is slow to come. And so what Peter says, look, it seems slow but it's not slow because on God's timetable, he's got his own perfect timetable and he'll do it on his own perfect time and it won't seem slow to him. And it might seem slow to you because you're on your human timetable and 30 plus years is slow to you, but it's not slow to God. So just be patient. He's going to come when he said he come. And I will point out to you in the Olivet Discourse, he said he was going to come within one generation. So I think that takes care of the arguments for the end of the world pretty good. I'm pretty strong on this. I think that Peter, despite the fact that I'm in an extreme minority here, I really believe that Second Peter 3 is talking about AD 70 and not the end of the world. All right, so I finished with six arguments in favor of AD 70 for First Peter, Second Peter 3 and three arguments for the end of the world. I report, you decide. Now I'm going to finish up this video by very briefly talking about this phrase, Day of the Lord, a phrase that futurists love to look at and say, oh, that's the end of the world, that's the end of the world. It's the final judgment, the great white throne judgment and so forth. No, it is not. Now, how do you know what the Day of the Lord is? You have to look at the context of the Scriptures. That's the only way you can determine the timing of when the Day of the Lord exists. Now, here's some miscellaneous judgments on the nations. Uh, and which were described as the day of the Lord and which were obviously not at the end of the world. We'll start with Assyria. This is Amos 5.18. He prophesied the time of Jeroboam II, right before Assyria wiped out northern Israel in 722. Amos 5.18 says this, Alas, you who are longing for the day of the Lord. <laughs> in other words, a day of judgment when God judges all his enemies. Alas, for those who are longing for that, for what purpose will the day of the Lord be to you? It will be to darkness and not light. Well, that's referring to Assyria, not the end of the world. And Babylon, I mentioned this earlier, uh, Isaiah uh, links the day of the Lord with judgment on Babylon. Isaiah 13, 6 and verse 9 says this, Wail, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come 
as destruction from the Almighty. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, cruel with fury and burning anger. But that's not the end of the world. That's not Judgment Day. That's on Babylon. By the way, the day of the Lord is an ancient Near Eastern term that referred to a day when an ancient Near Eastern king managed to wipe out all of his enemies. And the, the phrase day means he did it in a short time. So one day, all my enemies came and I, I rolled them up. So it's kind of a braggadocious type of phrase. Talking about the day of judgment of the king. Well, the day of the Lord, the Lord is king, and he's going to judge in a short period of time. And not necessarily in one day, by the way. It just means a time that the Lord's going to judge. All right, well, we've got two examples of day of the Lord referring to uh, Assyria and Babylon and not the end of the world. Here's one where the day of the Lord refers to judgment on Edom. Obadiah 15, for the day of the Lord draws near on all the nations. Now, I will say this. I saw a futurist point out that um, this day of the Lord refers to judgment on not just Edom, but all the nations. Uh, this is, I'm sure, referring to when Babylon came and wiped out uh, Ammon and Moab and Edom at, at around approximately the same time that they wiped out Israel in 586 B.C. And I think what Obadiah was saying is, uh, look, Babylon's coming to get all the nations, and you're one of them, and you're going to go, and you're going to go down too. I don't think it means that it cannot refer to judgment on Edom. I mean, the whole book of Obadiah is about judgment on Edom. I can't, I can't imagine why somebody would say just because God is, the day of the Lord is for all the nations, that therefore Obadiah was not referring to Edom. He was referring to all the nations at the end of the world. No, I don't believe that. Now let's look where the day of the Lord is referred to a judgment on Egypt. This is Ezekiel 30, verses 3 and 4. For the day is near, even the day of the Lord is near. A time of doom for the nations. A sword will come upon Egypt. Well, that's, that's another example. Doom for the nations. And then Egypt is one of the nations that Ezekiel was particularly talking about. A sword will come upon Egypt. It is not the end of the world. Now, futurists will say, well, yeah, but that's just a type of what's going to happen at the end of the world. Well, that's nice. A very nice assumption, but you can't prove it. No futurists can prove that. They just assume it. Can't prove it. All right, now. Here, as I said, context determines the timing of the phrase "day of the Lord." Well, here I've got a, 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 a verse that shows the last day, which is similar to the day of the Lord, it refers to the end of the world. This is in John six verses thirty-nine through forty, and this is the will of Him who sent me. Jesus is, ta is talking that I should lose nothing at all of that He has given me, but raise it up on the last day. That sounds like resurrection at the end of time to me everyone who looks on the sun i will raise him up on the last day well you know because of the connection with the resurrection of the bodies of christians that's how you get the timing the context of what day we're talking about john eleven twenty four 24 says this this is martha saying to jesus martha said to him i know that he referring to her brother lazarus i know that he lazarus will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Again, the resurrection is ref of, the, of the body gives us the time indicator that we're talking about the judgment day at the end of the world. So you got to go by context on phrases like that. Now, here's uh, some other verses, 8070, Luke 21, 22, Olivet Discourse, for these are the days of vengeance, which sounds like the day of the Lord, very similar idea. Well, we know as we study the Olivet Discourse, and I've done about, I've done several videos on the Olivet Discourse. We know that the Days of Vengeance refers to the destruction of Jerusalem in 8070 when the Roman armies came. Acts 2.20 says, The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes. This is Peter's Pentecostal sermon. This was referring to, um, uh, he's quoting Joel, and it's referring to uh, Pentecost. So the day of the Lord comes, uh, Peter is referring to the day of the Lord to Pentecost, which is not really judgment, unless you can say it's judgment on Israel. Uh, it's a very important day of the Lord, but it's not referring to the end of the world, whatever it is. It's not referring to the end of the world at all, because it's, it, it occurred during the time of Pentecost in the first century. And one more of our Second Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians 2, 1 through 2, which I've already gone over in great detail in one of these Preterist Potpourri videos. Paul says this, We ask you not to be quickly shaken to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Well, obviously the day of the Lord couldn't have come if the day of the Lord is events at the end of the world, the final judgment, because all the Thessalonians would have to do to know that the day, the final judgment hadn't come was to look around them. 
You don't see anybody being thrown into the lake of fire. That means the day of the Lord hasn't come yet. You don't see Jesus. The day of the Lord hasn't come yet. You don't see anything. It just looks normal. So that cannot refer to the end of the world. So I hope I leave you with the idea that if you want to study eschatology, you've got to look at the context of the words that are being used and don't take anybody's statements about things uh, without saying this. Really? Prove it. Show it to me. Show me the context. Show me the other verses. Show me the lexical definitions. Show me whatever's necessary, but don't just tell me that these verses refer to the end of the world. All right, that's it for Preterist Potpourri. Uh, in my next video, I'm going to take up the hyper-preterist heresy. I hope you enjoyed this.